All right, welcome to my part of the conference here. This talk is WSL While You Work, writing cross-platform PowerShell on the same platform. My name is Chris Blackton. I'm a full-time DevOps engineer at the Center for Data-Driven Discovery and Biomedicine at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which is a really long name to say, so we shorten that down to the D3B Center. On top of that, I'm also a Pluralsight author. I've been a regular contributor to sites like techsnips.io and Adam the Automator, uh, a few other places. And this, this talk has a bit of a weird history. It was uh, originally going to be given at the PowerShell and DevOps Summit in April of this year, but then obviously that didn't happen. So since then, Microsoft has put out a few changes to WSL. There have been a few uh, updates that I've tried to keep up with along the way. Um, in any case, this should be a pretty interesting talk for those of you who are interested in Linux or are already working with Linux but want to get better at it and don't want to buy a really expensive Mac in order to keep working on it. So just a quick high level of what I'm going to go over here. First, there's going to be some WSL 101, what it is and how to start using it. And then we're going to go more into some advanced WSL topics. You'll see some pretty interesting stuff here. And then we're going to start going over how to write cross-platform PowerShell. And these are going to be specific for PowerShell, but a lot of it's stuff that will apply to other programming languages as well. And then finally, I've prepared a, a little demo for the end of the talk so that you can see WSL in action. So first things first, let's go over some of the basics. There's actually two versions of WSL. There's WSL 1 and 2. And WSL 1 was kind of a, the first attempt Microsoft made at this. This was a couple years back now. But it actually takes the Linux commands and runs them through a Pico driver. So it's a small translation layer. So, for example, if you ran an ls command, which is the equivalent of a get child item or a dir command, it's not actually running that command on a Linux kernel. It's running it through a Windows NT kernel, and then that just gets translated using one of these Pico drivers that will return the way that it should have looked if it were run on a Linux computer. Uh, it uses all the same components as the host operating system. So there's a full file system that you can look up in Windows Explorer. There's a network interface card that's the one you, your host network interface card as well. All of it's using the same components. And then, as I mentioned, there's no Linux kernel. It's just a translation layer. And this had some problems. It worked for some people, but it had some problems uh, namely that not everything got translated as well as it needed to. I work with a couple of developers who just couldn't use WSL1 because it just wouldn't run some of the programs that they were using. That translation layer didn't work properly for them. And that's what brings us to WSL2. And it is able to run commands natively using smaller virtualized components and an actual Linux kernel. So the Linux kernel for WSL2 is actually an open source Linux kernel. Uh, if you want to go and check it out, it's on GitHub. I actually have a link to it in the slides for this talk. So at the end of the talk, I'll tell you where to find them. If you go back to this slide, you'll see the link for that kernel in the talk notes. But because it's actually running Linux commands natively on a really small virtual machine, it ends up being about four or five times faster than WSL1. <clears throat> For that reason, and a, a few others, I'm mostly going to be focusing on WSL2 in this talk. I actually don't know if there's a use case for WSL1. If there is, um, if you have one, I'd be happy to hear about it at some point. But WSL2 is the one we're going to be focusing on here. And this is a really nice graphic I borrowed from uh, Thomas Maurer. You should definitely check out his article on it. 
But in a normal virtualization environment like Hyper-V or VirtualBox, you have your hypervisor that's running the Windows kernel. And then your operating system, in this case Windows 10, is running on top of that kernel. What happens with WSL2 is that you're, you have the same hypervisor running a Linux kernel with a Linux operating system on top of it. And from there, you can actually treat it like its own virtual machine. It's got an isolated kernel. It's got an isolated kernel, an isolated uh, operating system, except it can share different things with the Windows 10 operating system. So in a way, it's a virtual machine running on Windows 10. It's like a guest Linux system to the Windows 10 host, but it's got some level of integration that we're gonna go into a little bit more in this talk. And if you look at it from that perspective, these virtual machines are pretty flexible. They can be snapshotted or saved or even uh, run in parallel with different operating systems. So this is the Windows 10 store. A lot of these distributions actually install as Apex packages, which if you needed to check something off on your 2020 bingo card, running Linux, um, running Linux operating systems as a Windows 8 store app is uh, something you can definitely throw on there now. But you're going to have some problems depending on how you use it. For example, if you install this distribution here, Kali Linux, which is specifically designed for infiltrating networks and, and offensive security on a corporate laptop, you are setting yourself up for a strong conversation with your InfoSec team. On the other hand, something like Alpine Linux here is the basis for a lot of Docker containers. It's incredibly small. I think the base distribution is only about two megabytes. So if you need an environment where you can just spin up a, an environment runtime similar to what's going to be in a container you're developing, you can just download Alpine WSL and run it from there. And you can install all these straight from the store. Um, I personally don't like the Windows Store. I'm an engineer. I like working on the command line. So with that in mind, let's go to our first demo. All right, so here I am in the Windows Terminal, and I've got a PowerShell 7 running on Windows here. You can see I made some changes to my prompt, so you can see that right away. But let's just run a WSL-L. And that's going to show you the different versions of WSL that I have installed on this device. Uh, if you want to run that again with the dash V flag, you'll see that the, the top one there, Ubuntu 20.04, it's listed as my default distribution, which means that if I just type in WSL, it's going to open up into the Ubuntu distribution. You see my prompt has changed, the, the path has changed a little bit. Whereas before in Windows PowerShell, or excuse me, in PowerShell 7, I was under my D drive in a folder called GitHub slash Summit 2020. In my WSL distribution, that's a mount point. So I'm on MNT slash D slash GitHub slash Summit 2020. And this goes into a little bit of what I was talking about earlier, is that WSL can share some resources with Windows. It's also got its own file system. So if I do a CD and a PWD, so CD is change directory, which will default to changing into the us current user's home folder. And then PWD will show you that I'm in a separate slash home slash Ubuntu directory for my Ubuntu user on this WSL instance but it can be a little hard to keep track of, oh, excuse me, a little hard to keep track of here. So if I'm gonna try out another distribution, I'm actually going to open it up here in another tab on my Windows terminal. And you can see I've got the theming there so I can help keep them straight when I'm doing development. But let's go back here for now I did say that we could install these from the command line, and I meant it. So if I do an ls, which in 
PowerShell 7 on Windows is an alias for get child item. You see I have an ubuntu.apex package here. And I just did that by running this command here, which is invoke web request. And Microsoft has set up a few different URLs for this uh, for based on version, but you can just download WSL Ubuntu. In this case, it's a 16.04 instance. And I'm not gonna finish this out because I don't think anyone's watching this talk in order to watch command bars load. But in order to install it, then I just add the Apex package like I would if I'm side loading a Windows Store app. So the next thing I want to do, and if we go back to our WSL list here, you see I have a distribution here called Go Distro. So I don't have Go installed on my local machine. If I run a Go version, it's not a it's not here. In fact, let me clear the screen so it's a little bit easier to see. But WSL also has uh, another parameter I can pass in called uh, distro. So if I wanted to pass in the go distro distribution of WSL, then that's going to open up a new prompt for me and I can type in go version. And you see that Golang is installed on this distribution. So let's get out of here for a minute. And I don't want to use uh, my Golang distribution anymore. I'm going to do a WSL unregister go distro. And then if I try and go in there again, you see there's no distribution with that name. But what happened to it? Well, it's gone now. And if I need to get it back, I'll have to re-import it. So as I mentioned earlier, you can um, save these off like a virtual machine snapshot. I have another tar file in here called godist.tar. And there is a WSL import command that I can run. Now I'll break this down a little bit. It's in this case, I'm importing a distro called go distro, and it does need some files, some space to put a virtual hard disk. As I mentioned, WSL two uses virtualized components. So I have to give it a path where it can store that virtual hard drive. And then it's asking me which file do I want to import the distribution from. Oh, excuse me. So I'm going to let that run for a minute. And if we copy this off here, we'll just wait for this to load. <clears throat> now if I rerun WSL-D, to enter go distro, you see my distro's back. I'll exit that. And because I have WSL2 set as my default version, it shows up running as version 2 in my WSL list. Now I mentioned that these files do need a place to excuse me, that WSL does need a place to store a virtual hard disk. So if I list what's in that uh, path I gave it earlier, you see there is actually a VHDX file with my WSL distribution and the file system for it. So I've made some change. Let's now pretend I've made some changes to that distribution and I want to pass it on to someone else or update the image in the uh, in a file share that I'm using. There's another command f called WSL export where I can take that distribution and export it into a new tar file. Like I said, I'm not going to let this run because none of you came here to watch progress bars load. But now I've what I've done here is I've created my distribution, I've versioned it, and I've, I've shared it with another developer on my team. Now that's pretty cool and all we can export local developments environments like this, but wouldn't it be even better if we could build it from code? So if we run another ls, I've got a directory here called go files. 
And if I just see what's in there, I have a Docker file and a Hello World file in Go. So let's take a look at the Docker file. And you can see that I'm actually just running this from the latest Golang container. I'm making a few changes to it, such as installing uh, sudo, I'm installing wget, I'm installing git and vim, I'm installing zshell, and I'm setting up a user with a very insecure password. But now, if I want to just run this distribution, or excuse me, if I want to build the distribution, I'll just build it using my Docker container and run it with a zshell entry point. And you see my prompt has changed. I've got a go prompt here. And if I run a host name here, it's going to show me a container ID. So I'm going to split my screen here and then just show you that it is running with a Docker PS. And that container ID matches what my Go distro, uh, my Go distro's host name is. So I can be reasonably sure that that's the same container there. And now we've seen a, a, a lot of you are probably familiar with Docker Run and Docker Build, especially if you've worked with containers before. But what you might not know is there's also a Docker export command. So I can now take that running distribution, I will copy the container ID and pass it in as a parameter to Docker export. And it's going to create this godist.tar in my folder path here, which is, we're now full circle because this is what I used to import the, excuse me, this is what I used to build the Go distro in WSL the first time around. So now we've, what we've done here is we've created a local development environment with tools built in as code and shared that in a Git repository with the rest of our team. If you've worked with dev containers before, it's very similar. It's just with a little bit more power behind it. So let's close out of here and go back to our slides. Next thing I want to cover is some advanced WSL. Believe it or not, we're, we're still in the beginning stages here. Let's go back to the terminal and do some more work with WSL. So as I said before, if I run the ls command, this is really just an alias for get child item in PowerShell 7 on Windows. So if I run it with the Linux options that I'm used to, it's not going to work because those parameters don't exist for get child item. However, what I can do is I can run my WSL command and then pass in ls and it will run it as the Linux command. So if I do the same thing with the flags that I'm used to, then it's going to render the output in the way that I'm used to from working on a Linux machine. But it's doing it with the files that are in my current directory on Windows, I keep saying Windows PowerShell, on PowerShell 7 on Windows. So if we go back to our, our friend, the Go distro, we can run WSL-D to enter the Go distro distribution and then run the Go version command. And it will show us that we are running Golang on that distro. So that's how we can control which tools are installed on WSL. Uh, we also have access to a few more parameters. So for example, if I run a WSL, who am I? Remember, this is going back to my default distribution, which is Ubuntu. There's another parameter here that I can pass, and that's the dash U or user parameter. So I can run this command as root, and it's going to run it in my default WSL distribution as root. And you can mix and match those up as you need to as well. If I just run WSL without any parameters, it's going to enter that distribution again. Uh, 
So let's actually, like I said, it's a little bit harder to follow along here. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to WSL for the rest of this demo. And as you can see, if we run the who am I, it's going to return Ubuntu, which is what we'd expect. But as I mentioned earlier, WSL also has access to some of the Windows files and programs, including the system32 path or the system path. So if I run whoami.exe, it's going to return the uh, machine name and username for the parent operating system or the host operating system in this case, which is my Windows 10 device. And you can see that if I run, you can see that a little clearer if I run something like which who am I? That's just gonna return the who am I in user slash bin on the WSL distribution. But if I run which who am I dot exe, you see that it's actually getting that from the mount point on my C drive under Windows System 32. And this is where you can get pretty interesting. Uh, on this, I work a lot with Terraform at my day job. So if I run a Terraform version, it'll run here, but I don't have it installed on this WSL distribution. See, it's alias to terraform.exe. So if I run an unalias and then try to run Terraform version again, it's not going to find it. So let's put that alias back. And now I can do something like try to change into another, another directory. So here's one that I was playing with not too long ago. And if I run a Terraform init here, that's going to run as expected because Terraform's not exactly picky about where it runs as long as it's using the correct binary, which in this case is either. However, there is a downside to this, and that is not every program is able to tell what the where it's running. Uh, not, not every program is going to be able to determine runtime context very easily. So I have PowerShell installed on this machine and if I go into a PowerShell session, look at that prompt, it does know it's running PowerShell 7 on Linux. But if I run PowerShell.exe, it still thinks it's running on Windows. So this can be a little bit tricky. You can't assume everything's going to work. You have to just try it out and see, see what works and what doesn't. Take it with a grain of salt. Maybe there's a, a future improvement to PowerShell where it can determine um, if it's running on a WSL instance from PowerShell.exe, but uh, right now it clearly doesn't. So let's go back here to my PowerShell 7 running on Windows, and we can mix and match some of these commands too. So I, I love using Chocolatey, the package manager, for example. So if I want to list all the packages that are installed on my local machine here, and that's, that's a lot of stuff to work on, but what if I want an easy way to filter through that? Well, I can just pipe that into WSL like I would if I were piping it into a different commandlet and then use the Linux commands. In this case, I'll grep, which is kind of like select string, but a little bit simpler. And I'll grep for, let's call it Terraform again. Great, so that shows me that I have Terraform installed on my Windows host. And if I want to update that, it'll simultaneously update the version I'm using in my WSL distros as well.
Now I mentioned that this is a lot like having a dev container, but you can actually, if you have the right extensions, you can run Visual Studio Code with a WSL remote backend. So in this case, I'm going to run code and I'll pass in a remote flag or a remote parameter. And I want to make sure it's running WSL using the Go, distribu Go distro. And then I want to make sure that it's running in the Summit 20, 20 folder here with that Go files folder earlier. And you don't see it because it's off screen, so let me pull it over here for a minute. It's actually starting up a Visual Studio Code server on my WSL distribution. And it's opening up a bash shell there. If I want to run go run hello .go, hello go.go, that's going to work fine because it's running on the WSL distribution built from the Docker container running on Windows with a Linux kernel. So yeah, again, if you're playing 2020 bingo, that's probably not something you thought you'd hear this year. So let's go back over here. And then finally, this is, well, not finally, but we're getting to the point that uh, I know all of you are excited about, and that's running cross-platform PowerShell on WSL. So let's skip back into the demo folder here. And I'm going to do something a little bit different. Since I've got the terminal here, I've got it set up to split pane between um, my Windows 10 host and my default WSL distribution. Oop. All right, so let's just adjust that prompt a little bit so it's easier to see. And I'll go ahead and just open a PowerShell here in WSL in the same folder that I'm using on Windows. Now with a lot of um, shell scripting, Linux and, window, and Windows used to be very picky about slash, about slashes. So for example, I have a directory under this folder called directory test, where it just has a bunch of directory says, this is a really long directory. If I run this in PowerShell, it's gonna return true on both systems. PowerShell is smart enough to know what you're trying to give it is not a, um, it's a directory object. And that wouldn't always necessarily work. So if we go back out to a bash shell and run an ls for that same directory. Yeah, it's going to fail because in a bash prompt, that backslash character that Windows uses as a directory separator is an escape character. So it thinks it's trying to escape the next character and not really uh, not show up. So let's go back into PowerShell. Now, another thing to be aware of is that uh, Linux systems are very picky about case. So if I make a hash table with a key val pair, and then I call a, uh, I retrieve the value for key with the wrong case, it's going to work on both systems because again, PowerShell is not a case sensitive language even when it's running on a case-sensitive operating system. Now this is where it starts to get a little bit tricky, is with environment variables. So on my PowerShell 7 on Windows, if I want to find out the computer name, it might be easy to look up a computer, the computer name environment variable. But if I do the same thing on a Linux WSL distro, that environment variable is not there. It's not set by default. In the same way, if I run env username, I'll get the username for my current user on Windows, but I'm not going to get anything on Linux. Um, 
if you want to dive a little bit deeper into that, it's because Windows and Linux don't actually set the same uh, environment variables at runtime. They just don't need to. It doesn't make sense for Linux, for example, to have a program files x86 environment variable. And it doesn't make sense for Windows to have a, a, a log name, for example. So if you want to get down to what the actual differences are, Windows just sets more of them by default. And a few of these are from WSL as well, but for the most part, Linux is not setting as many environment variables and definitely not the same environment variables. So if you use a lot of those in your scripts, you can't assume they'll always be there. What you'll have a little bit more luck with are the .NET classes under the, under the hood. So for example, if I'm pulling machine name from the system.environment class from .NET Core, it's going to be consistent across the board because they're running on the same machine. If I do the same thing with username, however, it's going to pull my Windows username on the Windows side and the Linux username on the Linux side. So again, this is not crippling. It's not going to break your script. You just have to be aware of it. The other thing uh, I mentioned earlier that these can share resources. One of the resources that WSL shares with the Windows 10 operating system is the system path. So this is a little, this looks a little bit like gibberish, but if we dig into it a little bit more, you see that, that it's actually mostly the same files. For example, I'm running the uh, Google Cloud SDK, which on my WSL instance is under MNT slash C slash program files x86 Google Cloud SDK. And on the Windows side, let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, here it is. It's under C colon program files x86 Google Cloud slash so on and so forth. And that's because the way these two operating systems treat paths is very different. But since but they do clearly share a path here, it's just been translated from one to the other. And I'll go into that in a little bit more. In fact, let's do that now. That actually goes back to uh, the io.path class in .NET Core. There's a property for directory separator, path separator, and volume separator which you can also call natively from PowerShell for use in your scripts. And this is going to return the correct directory separator and path separator, no matter what platform you're running on. So it's a, it's a good habit if you need to do a lot of parsing for path names to get into the habit of using these. Another thing you want to be aware of, especially with PowerShell scripting, is that PowerShell on Windows, most commands are going to run the corresponding PowerShell commandlet. Excuse me. That's not always the case. In Linux, for example, there is a date command, and it's not going to run a PowerShell commandlet. Even in the PowerShell prompt, it's going to run the native Linux command. So if we go and assign this to a variable and then run get type on that variable, you see that PowerShell is returning a date time object because everything in PowerShell is an object. Whereas on the Linux side, you're returning a string because everything in Linux is a string. And that can lead to some complications when you're doing your scripting. For example, if I have a log file and I want to uh, read that in somewhere, if I'm trying to convert that date, <clears throat> if I'm trying to convert the output of a date command into a date time object, that's not a big deal for Windows Power or PowerShell 7 on Windows. That's going to be a hard habit to break.
PowerShell 7 on Windows because it's turning a date time object into a date time object. On Linux, on the other hand, it's trying to convert that string into a date time object. So it's not going to work by default, but if with a little bit of extra massaging of the data, it will work just fine. You just have to know how to manipulate the string in order to get the, uh, the date time class to recognize it. But that's not exactly cross-platform because if I try and do that on PowerShell 7 on Windows, it doesn't know what I'm trying to do because it's still trying to run the get date commandlet. So if you're converting scripts over, this might be a bit of a problem, but if you're writing a new script that's supposed to run cross-platform, it's a good idea to follow the best practices. In fact, it's even more important to follow the best practices and not use aliases in your scripts. If you need to, there's a nice little switch statement here using is Windows is and is Linux. So when they when the PowerShell team introduced um, the open source PowerShell, they they added these default environment variables here for uh, is Windows, is Mac OS, and is Linux. And this will only return true uh, true on the platform it's running on. So let's close out of here for a second. If I run is Linux on Windows, it's going to return false. But if I run that on Linux, it's going to return true. And this switch statement here is a great way to tell where you're running on and write some custom logic around which platform you're using. This is actually how I, um, I modified this prompt a little bit. And I use a version of this to tell which operating system I'm on based on where I'm running PowerShell from. And the other nice thing about it is if we go back to Windows PowerShell and try and run the same thing, none of these were backported to Windows PowerShell by default, that's by, or by design. So the default option will always, will always run will always execute, excuse me, on Windows PowerShell. So if you need to run different things across PowerShell versions, this is a nice way to do that. So we've been through a few different areas by now, and now it's time to put WSL to the test. And there's only one test that can really determine whether something's going to last the test of time in computer science. And it's been the go-to for testing new technologies for over 20 years. And that is, of course, can it run Doom? So um, there's, a, there's a reason by, behind this, if, um, if you're following along. The Doom source code was actually open sourced in 1997. And there's been several different variants on it since then. I'm actually using the Chocolate Doom engine for my demo with the Free Doom game assets here. And it only compiles on Linux. There was actually a copyright error with one of the original sound libraries, which made it uh, impossible uh, legally to compile it on Windows. Uh, even if you look it up now, all of the instructions to compile the Doom source code have it running on uh, Linux or Linux emulators for Windows like Sigwin or something. It's also a great punchline, let's be serious. All right, so let's go back to our demo here. And if I run WSL LV again, I've got a distribution in the back called Ubuntu Demo. So I'm actually going to go ahead and open that up here. Now, Microsoft has promised graphical support for WSL at some point, but I didn't want to wait around for that. So I went ahead and did something a little silly. If I run ifconfig here, and I get the address for the 
the IP address for the um, WSL instance. I'm gonna go ahead and plug that into remote desktop. And I actually have a full open source RDP client and uh, desktop, open source desktop running on this WSL distribution. And you might be wondering, well, how do I know the username and password for this? Well, um, let's go back here to our summit folder. And you'll see I put another folder in here called RST. And that's got a Docker file and a tar file in there. So if we take a look at that Docker file, I'm actually building this from an Ubuntu 18.04 distribution. I'm installing a few tools as well as uh, some packages for... You, you can follow all this along, by the way, in the... Um, in the, I'll pass out this link at the end to these files. But then at the end, I'm adding on line 52 there, I'm adding a new user called Doomguy with the password Doomguy. So let's go ahead and enter that in. And you see, I've already started up a little bit, but WSL runs Doom. Let's actually quit out of this and I'll show you how I got here. If I open up a new terminal window, and I've got a, I've got the Chocolate Doom GitHub repository already downloaded. So let's go ahead and CD over to that. In fact, let's make this a little bit bigger. And then I'll actually change the data folder in here. And if we list what's in here, FreeDoom um, is the, the game assets. And the engine is Chocolate Doom. So from here, just run Chocolate Doom. And that's how that starts up. And if we go back into the Git repository here, I have another folder called PowerShell scripts. And if we, let's go ahead and I'll, I'll pull those over here so you can see them in a little bit more detail. There's two files in here. One is a test.ps1, which is just gonna run a series of pester tests. That's checking if it's Linux, if the FreeDoom assets are downloaded, and seeing if packages are installed using the apt packet package manager, which is native to Ubuntu Linux. And then, of course, it's getting the process using the get process commandlet and making sure that's running. I also have a Saki build script, which I, I didn't, I do not like Saki as much after working with something like Gradle or Jenkins. Uh, it's a little bit weird to get back into, but this one, since we already know that all the prerequisites are there from building it from a Docker file, is just going to run a check to make sure it gets all those, and then it will run the make files, as well as download the FreeDoom packages as well. So let's go ahead and, since we know it's running here on our remote desktop session, Let's just go into PowerShell. Oops. You see I'm actually running PowerShell 6 in this case. But it's still the same prompt. You can see everything from here. And we'll go ahead and invoke Pester. 
on test.sh or test.ps1, excuse me. And that's going to pass our pester tests. It's a little hard to see because of the font here. But here's the big one. If we run get process and go up to the top, WSL is running Doom. So now when you tell your manager what you learned at this conference, you can say you learned how to run video games in a background operating system hidden on your computer. And... Uh, well, at least he didn't spend too much on travel budget for this one. So let's quit out of here and go back to the slides. That's actually it for my talk. Thank you all so much for coming by and watching. Uh, you can find the slides and the code samples at this GitHub repository here. And if you want to reach out to me on Twitter, my, hash my username is devbyaccident. Thank you all for tuning in.